Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the difference between uh, processing on board the Walk Tem 2 using Spear and then using its desktop variant to then uh, also process Tem data. As I said in the uh, introduction, in the description of the session, it's going to start with a, just a bit of background theory about uh, TEM measurements in general, uh, just so that we know what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, then we'll look at the difference between the two software packages, the one that's on the instrument, the one that you uh, would use on your PC, and then we'll actually look at some, some real data and process it in both. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Jimmy Adcock. Um, I'm not very good with time zones, uh, but I'm also the product manager for the ABUM range of products uh, at Guideline Geo. We are an equipment manufacturer, geophysical equipment manufacturer. We have two brands, um, a ground penetrating radar brand, which is Marlo, and the ABUM brand, which is seismic uh, resistivity and transient electromagnetic systems. And uh, obviously it's the, the transient electric uh, electromagnetic system that we're going to be concentrating on today. Uh, we've got offices across the globe, but the core of the company is in Sweden. So head office is in Stockholm, R&D, uh, research and development in an office in Umeå. And then our factory where everything is manufactured is up in Marlow in the north of Sweden. I'm based in the UK in Manchester. I have a couple of colleagues here. Uh, but we have offices across the globe covering most of the time zones. So enough introductions, uh, let's get on to the interesting stuff, hopefully. Uh, let's talk about the uh, processing of TEM data. So what is TEM? Well, it's, um, it's a methodology of uh, mapping the, the structure and composition of the ground um, based on the conductivity of the ground. So uh, it's a, a, a method that responds well to conductive bodies. So that means that its primary uses are typically um, groundwater mapping and mineral searches. Uh, in the walk time unit that, uh, that, that, we can, uh, that we manufacture, we usually present the results as resistivity um, because it sits quite well then with our um, VES and our ERT products. Uh, but as I say, it, it's the conductivity of the ground that, uh, that the method is really responding to. It's an inductive method, so we don't have to have a physical connection to the ground. Unlike resistivity, we don't need to uh, bang electrodes into the ground. Uh, we're just doing this with uh, wire loops. Those are our transmitting and receiving uh, units. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a current flow in the ground. And we're going to look at how that is affected, how that current flow changes um, over time um, due to the structure of the, the earth. So we'll just bring up the next slide, which is actually a kind of schematic version of what it might look like in the real world. So we'll have our receiver and transmitter units coupled together. Um, we'll have uh, some kind of transmitter loop around the outside and then some form of receiver coils at the center of the layout normally. And what we will do is we'll introduce a current around that transmitter loop. And when that current is flowing at a constant rate, um, we will have a stable magnetic field set up around the transmitter loop. So this is kind of you know, basic textbook physics. Um, if you have a coil of wire with a current running through it, there will be a magnetic field associated with it. So that's what we do to start with. We, we set up this magnetic field and then we switch the current off very, very quickly and that magnetic field collapses. But because we can't just remove energy from the environment, it has to go somewhere and that collapsing magnetic field then is converted into um, electrical currents called eddy currents that will flow in a, a ring directly beneath the transmitter loop. Now they gradually spread out and downwards, and uh, people often refer to them as smoke rings because of the way that they expand and move out over time, uh, getting deeper and deeper into the ground. Now, because they are in themselves an electrical current that's flowing in a loop, um, they are also generating a magnetic field, and we call that the secondary field, and our receiver coils back at the surface are detecting that field and detecting changes in it. And the way that it changes is what tells us about what's beneath our feet. 
Uh, there are certain things we can do to sort of tune a system. So uh, the scale of the transmitter loop and the receiver coils kind of uh, alter how deep we are able to, to image. So if we have um, larger transmitter loops, uh, it's possible for us to reach deeper levels. Basically, when we switch that current off, if we have a much larger loop, we create a much larger uh, energy pulse to drive these uh, eddy currents into the ground. Now on the receiver side, if we have um, a small receiver coil, that will be able to uh, respond very quickly to changes in that secondary field. And what we see uh, with the, the spreading of these eddy currents, this transient moving through the ground, is that near surface, it's moving very, very quickly and the field is changing very quickly. And then as it gets deeper, uh, the, the rate at which the, the field decays slows right down and the, the measurements or the signal that we can record becomes much weaker. So this small antenna uh, will allow us to map in, in detail that very fast early part of the decay when the eddy currents are near surface, but it's not so good when the signals become weaker later in the um, transient movement through the ground because it's just not scooping up enough of that secondary field. So if we make a, a receiver coil that's bigger, then that allows us to um, scoop more of the magnetic field up and re more reliably detect the weaker later signals. So this is important because when we come to look at the data later, what we'll see is that we have multiple data strands that we want to deal with. And that's because the unit can actually have more than one receiver coil attached to it at the same time so that we can have a small loop that will be basically concentrating on the, the near surface responses and then a larger loop that is delivering us uh, information about what's happening at depth. So how might it look in a kind of um, sort of graphical sense? Well, this is a, a sort of representative plot of what's happening with the transmitted current. Uh, we switch the current on, uh, wait for it to stabilize in the transmitter loop, wait for the magnetic field to stabilize, and then we switch it off as quickly as we can. And it's during that switch off period that we create this EMF pulse, um, this energy that drives the eddy currents in the ground. And then we have an off period where we are measuring how those eddy currents are, are propagating through the subsurface and basically doing that through that secondary field. Once we've done that measurement, then the current is injected into the transmitter loop again, but this time in the opposite direction. Um, and we will always pair uh, positive and negative polarity pulses so that we don't end up charging the ground up in one direction or another and therefore adding bias into the result that we record. So once the current's been on in that opposite direction, we again switch it off as fast as possible uh, in order to be able to uh, generate that, that energy, uh, create those eddy currents. So during the off period, we're measuring how that secondary field decreases in strength. Um, and that is the raw data effectively. That is what we're going to take forward for um, processing. Now there is, a slight issue here and that is that when we have current flowing in the transmitter loop uh, the field that is associated with that that primary field is far far stronger uh, than anything that we're going to get back from the ground so that means that we can't actually start to record any data until all of the current has disappeared from the transmitter loop uh, if we tried to do that then we would either saturate our receiver circuit or we would just get utter noise, complete noise. So we have to wait for this current to switch off. And the amount of current that we put through the loop also determines how deep we're able to see. Uh, if we use a high current, again, we get a bigger pulse, stronger eddy currents, and uh, the transient will produce a, a stronger signal at greater depth. But if we have more current in the loop, it's much harder to switch it off quickly. Uh, so if you imagine a tap being turned off on the end of a hose, if you have a lot of water piling through that hose, which is like a lot of current going through an electrical wire, when you switch it off, the water at the far end of the hose doesn't just switch off instantaneously, it continues to flow for some time. And so that's kind of the equivalent of the problem that we have here. So 
if we use high current and large loops, we have a big um, period with, of, of waiting before we can start the measurement. And during that waiting period, we are losing information near surface. So the eddy current is already moving, starting to move, starting to get deeper. So the sooner we can start recording, the better we uh, are for, for shallow information. So the obvious answer is, well, why don't we just use a slightly smaller current? And if we use a, a smaller current, what we call a low moment, um, then we can start recording earlier. But the problem is that we have a smaller pulse, therefore the, the transient is not as strong and it will dissipate faster and we will lose the signal earlier. So therefore we won't get as deep. So on the, the walk time, what we do is we actually pulse, um, alternate between high and low moments, high and low current, uh, and we record both of those and combine them so that we can eventually produce just a single decay um, with uh, the low current information at the beginning where we want the shallow information and the high current stuff towards the end where we're interested in the deeper uh, responses. So again, this plays into how we're going to process the data because we will have separate data streams from the different current levels. Once we've measured the, uh, the responses um, from our basically four different streams, so uh, low current on the small receiver, high current on the small receiver, low current on the large receiver, high current on the large receiver, we can then plot that raw data and we can either plot it as the, um, the rate of change of the, the field strength, that secondary field, or we can actually convert it to an apparent resistivity, uh, which is what we've got in this plot here. And so the different colors that you can see in the different segments, those are the different streams of data. So there is uh, one, two, three, four different segments from the four uh, different types of measurement. We then take that, we run that raw data through an inversion package, and that's what we're going to concentrate on from here on in. And uh, that's hopefully going to provide us with a model of true resistivity as opposed to apparent resistivity against depth. So it will produce a layered model. And once we have that layered model, then we can start to make our interpretation. And that is either going to be a, a absolute interpretation where we know what the resistivity of particular units that we're looking for might be, um, or relative interpretation where uh, we've got a relatively homogeneous subsurface and we're looking for a change associated with something contained within that geology. So the obvious example being an aquifer, the presence of water reducing the resistivity, making it more conductive um, compared to the area that is, is drier. Just so that we're all on the same page when it comes to what we're doing in inversion software, uh, we're taking our raw data from the field and we are putting that into the software as a decay curve of some description. And what we then do is we give that over to the inversion software and the inversion software will develop a model of what it thinks the subsurface might look like. So normally there's some kind of starting model that the software will use and it will recreate the survey we did um, using the parameters that are transferred across with the data. So it uses same size loops, current, switch off times, uh, and it predicts what this model would present as raw data. Now, it's unlikely that on the first attempt, it's going to be anywhere close to uh, what our real data looked like. So then the inversion software will change the model and try repeating the process to see if it can get the curve to be closer to our raw data. The software will then keep doing that. We call these iterations. Every time it makes a new model, it's a new iteration. And every time it does that, um, we hope that the curve is going to get closer and closer to our real world data until we get to a point where hopefully the two are quite close together. At that point, the inversion software will stop. It will present us with the, the final model uh, and it will also give us uh, what we call a residual. And so that is some form of statistical analysis of how close the data um, that came back from the model 
matches the data that came from the real world. So if they sat directly on top of each other, if the two decay curves were exactly the same, um, there would be zero residual. And then the further the, the curves are apart from each other, the higher the residual becomes. So in a very simplistic fashion, what we're looking for are lower residuals once we've finished the processing. Um, there are caveats on that. And the biggest one is that we're looking for a low residual provided that we have a realistic model at the end of it. Inversion software doesn't necessarily know anything about where you were working. It doesn't know anything about the geology if you've kind of just let it run blind. And so therefore, if you were to run the model for a long time or run the iterations for a long time, um, it's possible that the software could uh, develop a model that fits your data perfectly, but which isn't geologically realistic. So it might have layers that are incredibly thin um, that you wouldn't expect to be able to resolve or values of resistivity that are extremely high or low that you would not expect to be seeing in the environment in which you're working. So when we look at these results, we need to be critical of them uh, and decide whether or not it is a realistic response that we're seeing. And that means that sometimes it may not be the model with the lowest residual that we take forward for our interpretation, um, but one sort of a couple of steps back perhaps uh, that is um, uh, presenting something that fits better with our knowledge of, of the subsurface where we're working. So as we say, when you come to um, do processing like this, you know, it is always important to have other information streams about the site that you're on. Um, th that might be geological maps, that might be other geophysical data, or it might just be your own knowledge of the environment that you're working in, uh, so that you have an idea of what you should expect to be able to see on that site and what is and isn't a realistic uh, end model. So inversion software, um, we we're sort of just talking generically about it, but uh, what the software that we're going to be actually using today is Orhu Sphere 10. Uh, so it's 1D inversion software. So we're just dealing with uh, basically the two parameters, uh, which are either the changing field strength or apparent resistivity, depending on how you want to display it, um, against time. So which then in our model becomes uh, resistivity and depth. Uh, so uh, Spear 10 is from Aarhus Geo Software in Denmark. Um, they've been around for, for a good while now. Uh, they make both uh, Spear TEM and also uh, Spear DC, which is for VES measurements. Uh, they also make a piece of software called Workbench, uh, which is like a GIS environment for processing geophysical data into which you can import um, our TEM data, uh, but you can also uh, process resistivity data, ground conductivity, um, airborne TEM, lots and lots of different options. Uh, so definitely a, a really versatile processing package. Uh, or Hostia Software are now part of the Sequent group, so um, a very big uh, player in the, the world of, of sort of uh, geoscience data processing and visualization. Um, and we've actually included the, the Aarhus TEM software uh, since the inception of the Walk TEM instrument. So the original one, uh, we're on Walk TEM 2 now, but the original one also had uh, onboard version of, of Spear, although I think in those days it was called View TEM. So if anyone's used that system, um, they'll be uh, familiar with the software we're talking about. So as I say, th there are two versions of the software. Uh, there is the onboard version uh, that uh, Aarhus uh, Geo Software supply us, uh, and then there is a, a desktop version as well. So the onboard version um, is included with our advanced receiver units. Uh, and allows us to, to deal with, with data while we're still in the field, basically as soon as we've completed a sounding. Uh, and then the desktop version is, uh, is a, a, an optional uh, package that we would normally recommend buying, and you'll see why um, as we go through sort of the, the rest of, of this webinar. But I'm going to just focus briefly on what the difference between the onboard version and the desktop version is. Uh, and then, as I say, we'll actually look at the, the data itself. So on the onboard version, um, it's all very simple. It will run off a couple of button presses. 
Um, and so that means that there is really no user in uh, a sort of um, user interaction in terms of setting up for the inversion. So it will use automated filtering. It will um, basically look at the uh, standard deviations um, on, on the measurements. So, so looking at how the, the values have varied between stacks. Um, it will then also use a fixed starting model uh, to begin the iteration process. It will automatically select the inversion parameters that are going to be used. So in terms of um, how the, the, the model looks at the end. Uh, and then once we run the inversion, that will be stored in the database of uh, that particular sounding. So when we export the data from the instrument, um, we will then have that inversion taken with the raw data. So we've still got all the raw data there, ready to be worked on again, um, but the, the final result of the inversion also comes across with it. So we can actually um, take that result and we can, um, well, we can open the raw data in, in the desktop version of Sphere, uh, and then we can uh, have more interaction, more control over how we run the inversion. Uh, but we can also compare directly then with the original instrument version of the, um, of the processing. Uh, the results could also just be imported directly into the workbench package, this uh, broader GIS processing package uh, as well. And so then um, we can analyze and visualize the data in there as well. Um, I would say that the onboard uh, primarily is there for um, excellent for, for QC, uh, quality control of your measurements, because if you don't have enough decent data to actually run an inversion and, and produce a, a reliable model at the end of it, uh, the software will tell you, it will just say there aren't enough data points here for me to actually run an inversion. Um, and also it'll give you an impression of the geology that you're working over the top of. It should give you a, you know, a good idea of, of how the, the resistivity is, is changing with depth. Um, it won't be precise because obviously everything has been done in an automatic fashion, uh, but it is pretty close. And we'll, we'll look at the comparison between the two shortly. So excellent for QC, excellent for understanding what you've stood on top of. And that can then inform you as to whether or not you might need to change some of the settings that you're using or change the configuration of the physical um, uh, layout of, of the, the hardware um, to, to really make sure that you come back to the office with the, the best possible data. Desktop version of Spear, um, it, it basically has everything and more than that you would expect from a, a, a TEM inversion package. So you now have complete control over the filtering of the points. So we can pick and choose um, which data to keep and which data to discard. Um, very useful for when we have these different data streams from the different current injections and the different loop sizes uh, to be able to just pick and choose the ones which are working the very best at every part of the decay. Um, we can actually use a custom starting model. So if we know something about the geology that we're working over the top of, we have some a priori information, uh, we can actually seed the inversion so that it's starting from a point that is closer to reality already. Uh, we have much more control over the inversion parameters that are being used. Uh, so um, again, we can change the model, um, we can um, change how the inversion is running. We also have the ability to in, do an inversion for IP effects as well. So rather than just getting a, a, a model of the um, resistivity with depth, we could run the inversion so that we get a model of chargeability as well. Uh, we can export both data and images with the onboard version. Um, you're basically limited to, to taking a screenshot uh, from the instrument uh, until you actually take it off and put it into another package. Whereas with the desktop version, as you would expect, uh, you can export the data um, either as a, a graphical table, uh, images, or as raw numbers that can then be imported into something else. And Spear also offers uh, an automated report production. So basically a one pager, uh, which presents you with your sounding curve, your resulting model, and uh, some header information about the measurement itself. Really useful kind of quick output for, uh, for each sounding. Um, so in summary, 
the onboard version of SPEAR is there primarily for uh, QA purposes, so quality assurance. So let's make sure that the data we've collected is good and will basically allow us to run an inversion. So the onboard uh, SPEAR will look at the data and if there aren't enough data points to be able to run a reliable inversion, it will actually just give you a message and say, hey, there's not enough good data here. Uh, and so then you can go back and you can look at the environment, see if it's something to do with that, look at the settings you've used, see if there's something there or the physical setup of the instrument. Um, it's also there to be able to give you that first look of what's beneath your feet. Um, so the spread of, of resistivities, the kind of layer thicknesses, and that can actually be really useful in terms of um, um, making the, the settings that you use as well suited to the environment that you're working in as possible. Because rather than being blind, you can very quickly say, oh, OK, I think actually we'd benefit from using a slightly different measurement script, using a different size of loop. Um, or actually, you know, we could get rid of one of these um, receiver coils because actually we're not seeing that deep. So we'll just use the, uh, the smaller loop and actually make our field process a bit quicker. Desktop version is there for what you'd imagine. It's there for the full processing and reporting. So we would normally recommend that um, you always take the desktop version along with uh, the onboard. OK, so let's have a look at the software itself then. So I am connected, I have a warp tone, which is uh, just over there. Uh, so I'm connected to that remotely. So let's just bring this onto the screen. Hopefully make it a little bit bigger. So when we start the warp tone up, um, this is the screen that we would uh, come into. And this is the, the sort of uh, setup screen for the measurements where we do a bit of file management, we set up a project, um, define what measurement script we're going to be using. So that's defining how long the instrument is listening for and um, how, um, so how small the divisions are in terms of recording that decay. So all of that's set up in the measurement scripts. Uh, how many times we want to do a stack of the uh, measurement cycle. So um, how many repetitions of that? And then the total time for a measurement is then presented to you on the right. Uh, down here, there's just a, a little bit of information about how many repetitions there'll be of current pulses. So you can see that there'll be 1,080 uh, low moment current pulses and 500 high moment current pulses. Um, and that is in one stack. So you can see if I change the number of cycles, the number of stacks, um, you would multiply these numbers by that to get an idea of how many individual current pulses there are going to be uh, in the measurement. Uh, then we just set up to tell the instrument what kind of transmitter loop we're using. Uh, we can do some analysis of the transmitter loop so that we can put the correct damping resistor on it. So that's just basically to clean up the signal that we are putting into the ground. Uh, so we can uh, do that here as well. And then we just tell the instrument uh, what the receiver coils are. So our two standard are the RC5, which is an equivalent, it's a half meter across, but it's the equivalent of five square meter um, loop. And then an RC200, which is 10 meters across, two turns, equivalent of a 200 square meter uh, receiver loop. And so we can set those up on either channel of the instrument, tell the instrument whether we're measuring the Z component, the vertical component, or some other. So by basically tipping the uh, receiver coil up onto its side and then whether the receivers are in the center of the loop or offset by some distance outside of our uh, transmitter loop so that is basically referencing the middle of the transmitter so we would do all that we would run into our measurement screen then so once we've set everything up and have a transmitter actually connected we just hit play and it would cycle through measuring and showing us the individual decays for each of the uh, repetitions in here to so be able to keep an eye on the, the raw data as it comes in. And then once that's done, we can jump to our post processing screen. And this is where we can actually um, do something with the data. So I think project 27 is one where I went out and just quickly grabbed some data from uh, the hill that's behind my office. Uh, so there was a couple of different uh, um, setups that I tried and basically we can take the individual soundings within the project and we can, if we want to, have a quick look at the uh, 
um, the data itself. Uh, so these are our decay curves, and um, we basically have a different color for low moment, small receiver, high moment, small receiver, low moment, large receiver, high moment, large receiver. So we can um, look at those uh, curves and, and just get an impression of whether it looks like good data or not. And then if we've got the advanced unit, the advanced receiver, well, then we can do the right click um, and say model data. Or if we don't want to have a mouse attached, we can use the instrument entirely from the front panel. So we just use this shortcut menu here and we just say shift and four to model the data. And what will happen now is that the SPEAR software will open up in front of uh, the acquisition software. And then we are presented again with a plot of our data. So this is um, showing the data as apparent resistivity uh, against time. Um, and we can, if we want to uh, jump through the screen, Uh, we could instead look at db by dt, uh, which is the, um, the, the change in signal strength over time. So um, it's kind of personal preference, which of those are your preferred uh, uh, view to look at. So effectively, that's, that's kind of the limit of our interaction with the data for the onboard, um, onboard inversion. We can um, look at the individual curves and we can change uh, how the view is displayed. So I switch to the other tab. Then I simply just select run inversion and press enter. And then it will go through the process of running these iterations of these different models uh, to try and find one which will fit with the data that we have provided it. So as I say, there's, uh, it's, there's a lot of automated filtering in here. So what you can see in the data plot is that anything that is colored uh, will be used. That will be taken forward and um, uh, be a part of the inversion process. Anything that is grey uh, is not going to be used. That's going to be um, discarded. So uh, if I was on the data view and I'd actually looked at the raw results, so where we see the individual um, stacks rather than the averaged result, uh, you would also be able to see the noise uh, curves. So when the instrument is measuring, it's cycling between high and low current, uh, but it will also take a set of measurements when no current has gone around the loop at all so that it can analyze how much background noise there is because there is electromagnetic noise everywhere in the environment and it's impossible for us to not pick that up. Um, you know, coming from radio transmission, phone transmission, um, far off thunderstorms, uh, all sorts of places, solar activity. So if we can, understand where the noise floor is, then we can automatically understand sort of what the limit of our data is. So at the point where our signal strength drops into that noise, we can say, right, that's it. We're, we're done now with this decay curve. Anything below that we'll get rid of. So if I plotted the noise on this, you would probably see it um, jumping up and down and around here, uh, coming through at about this time. And so once the curve gets into that noise, then the standard deviations go crazy um, they're, they're go off um, really, really big because effectively we're measuring a lot of random noise. OK, so there we go. There's uh, the model that it's presented us with. Um, and as I say, it, it kind of is just using default values. So uh, we've got quite a, um, a long window here. But in fact, that window is far deeper than we actually have reliable data to. Uh, so the green dashed line is showing us our estimated DOI, and the estimated DOI is 90, almost 94 meters. And then um, we've got this smooth model of the resistivity variation with depth, um, you know, showing that uh, we're starting in the, I don't know, two, 300 ohm meter region, uh, dropping down and then coming back up again. So that's basically what we can do on the instrument. As I say, we can grab some screenshots of this, um, but now we can say, hey, I, you know, I think that's a pretty decent curve considering the geology I'm working on. Uh, on the hill up above me, there's um, 
oh, you've got a, a bit of overburden, you quickly drop into a weathered, very wet rock, um, which then um, gradually becomes more competent as you get deeper, so the resistivity sort of starts to go back up again. Um, but that kind of DOI is probably about as good as I could expect uh, up there. And so, you know, if, you, if you're doing a lot of, uh, of soundings in, in one location, um, you very quickly get an idea of, of what is normal. And then by doing this, you can say, hey, this one is, is definitely, there's something wrong here. Let's go back and double check what we've done with the measurements. And let's check the, the setup and everything like that. So that's our data. That's now been stored on the instrument in the database along with the raw data. So I can just press escape to close that down. And then I can choose to uh, export uh, this project uh, to a USB drive. So let me just stick one into the machine. And then from the shortcut menus, we're just going to export projects. So we just say shift and six. Uh, it's automatically detected my USB drive, so just say export, and it's going to take the all the raw data, so all of the kind of raw written um, decays for each of the individual uh, stacks, and then it's also going to take out a, a database of the kind of um, of all of those individual measurements combined into one file. And inside that database, there will also be the result of the inversion that we've just run on the instrument. And when I bring them into Spear, I'll be able to see that so we can compare the two, the one that was done on the instrument and the one that we've done um, by hand. Okay, so let's close that down. Uh, so as I said, Spear is, uh, uh, it's allows you to also invert uh, VES data if you have the license for it. So I do, so I get the option of which I want to pick. So I just choose TEM and then I say open project. And uh, yeah, there's, that is my USB stick. So copy the project that I've just downloaded to the, the USB and I'm just going to drop the project onto my desktop for now. So project 27, there we go. There's the, the database file, good, a database.gdb. So open that up. And so in here, um, we can see there are actually three stations in this project. Uh, so that is um, three separate soundings with separate parameters, different parameters used or different voltages driving the current around the loop. And um, we can check the map and just make sure that this really was collected on the hill behind. Yeah, so uh, I'm somewhere down here. We're up there. And then again, we get to, to be able to see uh, the individual uh, components. So station one, I've got four channels of data and then I've got four noise measurements. And if I look at the raw, then I'll be able to see the noise and also uh, the, the the data lines as well. So we see that um, it drops into noise around about here. So we know that anything beneath that we're not going to want to use. So we can simply just say, okay, let's get rid of all of these data points by selecting them and say not in use. So now it's up to us as to um, what, we, what we keep and what we discard uh, in, in the data. So that's an easy one to do because you know that once it's under the noise floor, um, there isn't really much point in keeping it. Uh, then once we, um, once we get into the, the main decays, well, then we want to start to be uh, a little bit more clever about what we keep and what we discard. So what we said was that um, we will have a stream, which is the, the low current on the small receiver. So if I go to channel one, uh, we can see from the header information that that was just one amp. So uh, I could uh, rename that say that's low moment and that's my RC5, that's my small uh, small receiver. If I click on the next one, uh, we can see that that's got a higher current, so that is the high moment 
and it's the second channel, so that's on input one. So that's also the RC5, not RS. Then we've got um, one amp again. So this is another low moment measurement. And now it's we're onto the second channel. So this is low moment. And this is RC200, the bigger receiver coil. And then we've got another one with eight amps and we rename, and that is high moment underscore RC200. So what we said was that uh, when we're up looking at the shallow data, uh, it's the, the low current and the small loops that we trust. And down at depth, it's the high current and the larger loops that we trust. And in the middle, um, they should all kind of sit pretty closely on top of each other. So it's really only where it diverges that we need to do a bit of filtering. And so if you want to see a little bit closer, you can zoom in. And so we see a bit of divergence there. And so in this instance, you could then switch off the various components. Uh, so uh, the red one is our RC200. Uh, so we wouldn't really want that one. We wouldn't want the um, high moment on the small transmitter and we wouldn't want the uh, high moment on the uh, uh, sorry the low moment on the larger receiver so if we go through this low moment rc5 that's the one that's most reliable near surface high moment rc5 and um, we probably don't trust the uh, the the first few points so we can just say not in use then likewise uh, for the larger of the receiver coils and um, the early gates we're not necessarily going to want to keep so we can uh, remove those and then uh, also especially the, the high uh, moment on the the larger receiver uh, we're not going to keep that at the early time so again we can select and say not in use so we're just going to keep the green one through here and we would basically apply that kind of logic um, for for the entire data set so we would cut out uh, most of the the bottom end of the low moment on the small receiver we'd probably cut out a little bit of the end of the high moment on the small receiver And then for the larger receiver, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to take out the, the earlier stuff. But keep the later. And then between the low current and the high current, it would be the high current that I'd prefer to keep. Because you see it doesn't diverge quite as much uh, there. So ultimately, we end up with one curve that's made up, hopefully, of the best bits of all four. And then once we've done that, we can then put that forward for inversion. And the first step is just to just run a standard inversion. So run it from the regular starting model. Uh, so that'll either be uh, the default one or one that you have introduced uh, to the software. And the only uh, option we have when we run that uh, little default inversion is the smoothness constraints. So um, you can say whether the smoothness is low, normal, or high. So low smoothness uh, allows the, the resistivity to change in bigger steps between the various layers in the model. And a high smoothness constrains it much more tightly or uh, keeps it more tight so that you end up with a, a smoother changing model. And so that's generally based on what you know about the geology that you're working over. Do you expect there to be sharp interfaces with a, a, a contrast across them in resistivity? Or do you think that it will be something um, a little more, um, uh, it's something that is, is going to change more smoothly over time? So once we've done that, we should end up with a model on the right hand side of resistivity against depth with our DOI presented as 80 meters. and um, then on here we've got the data points that have been used as the little um, crosshairs and then the how the model is fitting within those as the solid line and we get presented with a data residual which is 0.87 so um, if i spent more time on this i could probably make it fit better um, and i would do that by um, removing outliers so i haven't 
you know, I've still got a couple down here that perhaps aren't the most reliable data points. Um, I could, if I wanted to actually suggest that there's a, um, give it a, a bigger margin um, on those later data points because I suspect they might be affected by noise. So allow the model more leeway to move um, without kind of counting as being outside of the bounds of, of the data. Um, then choosing better um, crossover points between the, the different data streams. Um, typically around about 100 microsecond mark, you, you tend to find that um, the low and the high moment crossover from being more to uh, less reliable, or you cross over from one being more reliable than the other. And similarly for the different size receiver loops. So again, a bit of um, clever choice in which data points to keep more keep bringing your data residual back down lower and lower. Um, we end up with two different models when we do this. Uh, we end up with the smooth version, which is what we saw on the instrument, and then uh, a few layered model. And the few layered model, we have the ability to edit. So if we click on edit under the inversion tab, we can actually grab any one element of the model, either a depth or a resistivity value, and we can shift it around to try and refine the model. And you can use this either to just sort of by eye, bring the curve closer to your data or actually introduce known values. So if you've got some core data that says, hey, the geology changes at a particular depth, then you can put that in and the software will allow you to um, actually fix the position of the, the interface or fix the value of the resistivity, depending upon whether you selected one of the horizontal or vertical elements. And so well, then when it does the inversion, it then can't change that layer by more than the defined parameter. So you can either lock it completely or allow it to move by a certain percentage. And that depends on how reliable your prior knowledge is, your other data stream might be. So again, that's just helping to seed the inversion, hopefully to produce a better result at the end of it. Uh, final thing just to have a quick look at is we should probably compare how this model looks compared to the one which came off the instrument. So if I click smooth layered inversion number one, that's the one that we uh, generated on the walk 10 itself. So that's the onboard inversion. And what we see is that um, the scales are slightly different in terms of uh, where it's chopped the, uh, the graph off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually force the software to plot these to the same depth. So um, probably about 140 meters. Uh, don't auto scale the depth. What's the closest option to 100? There we go. Let's make it 125. So let's flick between the two. And what we see is that our DOI between the two is pretty similar. Um, the field inversion, that's this one. Um, kind of estimates the DOI to be a little bit deeper than the one that I've processed. And that's probably because I've been a little harsher in terms of how far up the decay I've cut that off. Um, but, and you tend to find that that the field inversion tends to be a little bit more generous on the, um, the, the DOI. But if we look at the overall shape of the curve um, and the, the, the resistivity values that are in there, uh, they're a pretty similar shape. And um, they're a pretty similar distribution of values. So there's a little bit of different sort of top and bottom. But if you were stood in the field, ran that inversion, and then made an estimation of, of what was beneath your feet, um, then came back in and did the, the proper editing of it uh, and reran the inversion. Um, the reassuring thing is that you're never a million miles away. So it should give you enough information to make sure that, as we say, A, you're collecting the best possible data you can, and that when you get back to the office, you'll have something usable. And B, give you the opportunity to actually fine tune the setup that you've got on the instrumentation, again, to ensure that we collect the best possible data that we can. So once we've got our models in here, the other thing that the software will allow you to do on the desktop version that you can't on the instrument is actually do an export. Uh, so we can either export the models uh, either the smooth or the layered, and we can export those in various data formats or as images and um, as CSV tabulated data, 
or as say we can do this one page um, report. Uh, let's just drop that on the desktop for now. Yeah. Uh, which gives us header information about the measurement, tabulated data, model, and sounding curve. So really quick way, really great for throwing in report appendices or delivering a quick interim to people. Um, then also we have the ability to export the data in various formats so we can take our individual stations uh, and export them as um, commonly people will use a USF and that allows you to pretty much drop it into um, a whole bunch of different uh, geophysical software packages. Okay, uh, that was a very rapid run through um, of the, the desktop version. I would say that if you're interested in SPEAR, uh, there are some really good webinars uh, by Aarhus Geo Software uh, on their website. Uh, if you want to know more about how it works, you can always contact me as well, um, especially how it interacts with the, the Walk Tem 2. Um, be happy to, uh, to um, talk to you about that um, and show you a slightly more in-depth demo if uh, if you're interested. So I'll say thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'd say if there are any other questions, I'm happy to hang around. Um, so feel free to chuck them either into the Q&A box uh, on the meeting window or into the chat box and I'll take them now. No. Okay, well, in that case then, thank you very much for attending.